18 disturbing and frightening Junji Ito monsters. In the realm of horror manga, no one is more well known than Junji Ito. He has garnered a sizable fan base since his debut in the late 1980s. Over the years, some of his biggest works have also been made into live action films or dramas. Junji Ito was born in the prefecture of Gifu in 1963 and began writing comics in 1987. His first manga contribution was acknowledged with an honorable mention from the Kazuo Umezu Prize. And that was only the beginning. Tommy, a manga series about a supernatural girl slash entity named Tommy that was suitably terrifying, was one of his earlier works. Ito is the author of several notable works, including Gyo, Uzumaki, Cat Diary, Yu and Mu, and a few others. Many of his short stories have been included in a few anthologies. One such collection is Fragments of Horror, which was translated by Viz in the United States. Tommy and Uzumaki, for example, have been transformed into films and television programs. Junji Ito has his own set of tricks and tropes that he enjoys using. Aside from the obvious ones like body horror, grossness, and unfathomable supernatural power, Ito employs a variety of additional ways to communicate his terror. Some are subtle, while others are more obvious. The audience is kept on edge by a combination of body horror, scary surroundings, and an overall sense of unease. He truly is a master of horror. And today, we will look at some of his most bizarre and horrifying monsters of all time. Put your seatbelts on, because you're in for one hell of a ride. Before we go into our explanation, we have a very small request. If you like our content, please support us by subscribing to our channel. This is a small click for you, but for us, it means a lot. Thank you. Let's begin. <laughs> Now I am the star. <laughs> Fuchi, Fashion Model, Episode 2, Part 1. Fuchi is a cannibalistic monster, serial killer, and professional model that appears as the main adversary in two of Junji Ito's manga stories, Rumors and Fashion Model. She also has a little part in the film Voices in the Dark. Fuchi is incredibly slim, but she is also extremely tall and large in size. You've been filming only her scenes for a while now. When will you be putting me in front of the camera? She has a bony face with frighteningly pointed features, and her lips remain slightly clenched even when she speaks, concealing the razor-sharp fangs in her mouth. She usually dresses normally, but in rumors, she wore a bikini when attacking people in the swamp. She, like many of Ido's characters, exudes an uncanny air, and when she attacks, she is unmistakably vicious, remorseless, and monstrous. She doesn't think twice about stalking and devouring her prey, and also seems to enjoy playing with her victims. Her most memorable appearance was in Fashion Model. Fuchi's employment as a professional model is somewhat vague. It is entirely possible that she is performing an illusion or mind-bending trick or that her unique appearance has gained her a reputation in the fashion world resulting in more gigs. In Fashion Model, she obtains a role in Iwazaki's short film, after which she goes on a rampage in the location where they were filming, killing many crew members who were Iwazaki's friends, as well as murdering and eating the indie film's lead actress. She is a merciless killer with a fondness for individuals who like or appreciate her appearance and will go to any length to be with them. Definitely a terrifying monster that I will stay far away from. Hellish Doll Episode 1, Part 2 The novel that the Hellish Doll is seen in, Frankenstein, Junji Ito's adaptation of the Mary Shelley novel. In this novel, children have begun to succumb to an early onset of doll's disease, which leads them to gradually transform into doll-like constructs incapable of movement or speech. When a young girl named Maria succumbs to the illness, her parents try to console themselves by reminding themselves that she will always look like a beautiful doll and will be with them forever. They don't understand why the parents of the other sick victims abandon their children. However, when Maria continues to degrade and change, including the growth of tentacles and horribly extended limbs, her parents are compelled to put her to rest. This version of Little Maria is known as the Hellish Doll, as she grows and mutates into a hideous creature that definitely puts Annabelle to shame. 
Her burial is also not an easy job as her parents have to deal with their daughter who is no longer human and has instead turned into a tentacled monster that they could not fathom. She transforms from doll into inhuman entity, looking like a terrifying mix of centipede, tree roots, and teeth with bright blue eyes that follow you wherever you go. Positively horrifying and a nightmare fuel. That is exactly what one would expect from the scary genius of Junji Ito. Cannibal Boy Haunted House Junji Ito wrote and illustrated the short story, Secret of the Haunted Mansion. It's the fourth installment of Voices in the Dark. The plot revolves around two buddies who enter the eponymous haunted house while interacting with its landlord. In a town, a haunted house attraction debuts. Despite the fact that it is originally suspected of being a ruse, everyone who visits is afraid. The police are also brought in to investigate. Kuichi and Satoshi, two young boys, try to sneak into the mansion at night but are apprehended by the proprietor. He admires their bravery and lets them explore the house for free. It turns out that the proprietor is hiding a dark secret. That is, the existence of his cannibalistic, monstrous son. He moves from town to town with his haunted attraction in tow to escape his demonic wife and feed his cannibal son. The man had also managed to enslave his entire family into becoming live attractions within the haunted house. But our focus is the cannibal boy here. The boy is small in stature, but has large eyes which look ravenous and hungry for blood. He also has a large, outstretched mouth that is lined with razor-sharp teeth. All this little boy speaks about is how hungry he is for tender human flesh. The protagonists encounter him inside the very end of the haunted house, munching on the arm of a dead policeman. One of the friends is caught by him and succumbs to the cannibalistic nature of the boy. The sight of the boy will scare you to no end. Think twice before you enter a haunted house. You never know what is fake and what is real. Window Monster Window Next Door Episode 6 Part 1 People love looking outside their windows, enjoying the scenery and a breath of fresh air, but what if you looked outside and saw something horrifying? Would you dare to look out in the dark? Hiroshi Sakaguchi and his family move into a new house in Junji Ito's story, The Neighbor's Window. He's interested in the house next door, which has only one window. They discover that the inhabitant, a middle-aged woman, is never seen. Although, neighbors have reported seeing a person at the window at night. When Hiroshi goes to bed, he hears a voice calling his name and sees a woman with a terrible corpse-like visage and clawed bony hands inviting him to visit her. This terrifies him, and yet, he can't believe his eyes. Hiroshi dismisses it as a dream, but the next night, he hears the voice again, this time upset because he did not visit. When he looks outside the window, he sees a woman attempting to get to his room with a laundry line pole. Hiroshi knocks the pole down and hurries into his parents' room, crying out for rescue. No one apart from Hiroshi can see her, which makes matters worse, as she keeps trying to reach him. In fact, her window stretches all the way to his, and the story ends with a cliffhanger, as Hiroshi's fate at the hands of the terrifying woman in the window remains unknown. This monster is a classic example of Junji Ito's ability to make any situation uncanny and eerie, which draws the audience in and creeps them out. This one will undoubtedly make you draw your curtains at night, lest you spot a window monster. Tommy Mutation Tommy Tommy is probably one of Ito's most well-known horror creations. Junji Ito established Tommy as a multimedia franchise. Tommy Kawakami was a regular, gorgeous adolescent until she was brutally murdered and dismembered on campus. She became substantially less normal after she returned to class a week later, looking unscathed. Her snobbish demeanor and devious techniques of stealing lads away from their partners earned her no friends and when she was inadvertently killed by two men fighting for her, the entire class agreed to cut up her remains and remove the evidence that she had ever returned. Yet, time and time again, Tommy reappeared. And more and more copies of Tommy reappeared as well. If Tommy wasn't convincing a man to go after and kill one of her doubles, her attraction was so strong that the man would try to murder Tommy to prevent anyone else from having her beauty. Tommy, despite their love, has no feelings for any of them. She just cares about herself. Tommy can rebuild herself completely from the slightest piece of herself. 
from a severed limb to even her hair or blood. Tommy may even absorb someone who has a piece of her tied to them, gradually taking them over until they are also Tommy. Radiation accelerates the process, and fire may be the only thing that can completely destroy a Tommy. Though, this has never been demonstrated clearly. Even when not hurt, a malignant Tommy will occasionally sprout out of another, causing both Tommies to persuade bystanders to murder the other. Tommy, in addition to her healing abilities, has the capacity to force people to obsess over her and obey any command she issues, including murder. The experiment begins when a doctor decides to put Tommy's regenerative abilities to the test. The outcome is a massive amorphous blob with more than 10 heads, rearranged limbs, and a terrifying sectional larvae-like tail that resembles a deformed insectoid. No, put him down! Uh, let go! Uh, 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 uh. The Scarecrow. Scarecrows, Episode 11, Part 2. Junji Ito wrote the short story Scarecrows. It is the second chapter of The Face Burglar, Volume 4 of Junji Ito's Horror World Collection. A tiny village's residents discover a peculiar phenomenon in their cemetery. When a scarecrow is erected near a tomb, it eventually takes on the appearance of the person buried there. But is it true that only appearances are carried down? As it turned out, that was not the case. It started with the death of a young girl named Yuki, and her father placed a scarecrow on her grave to ward away pests and other pesky people, especially her boyfriend, Toshio. However, what was a simple scarecrow soon turned out to be much scarier. The scarecrow gained the features of Yuki and almost became lifelike, and it would remain that way as long as the scarecrow remained at the grave. Seeing this, the other townspeople also began to do the same so that they could see and talk to their loved ones after they passed away. It turns out that these scarecrows also tried to fulfill people's wishes from beyond their grave. Yuki wanted to marry Toshio, and her spirit brought him to the cemetery. When he was too scared of her scarecrow human appearance, he was killed by her. They say not to mess with the dead and allow them to move on, and this story does a fantastic job of portraying it. The scarecrows were quite horrifying to look at, along with being extremely creepy because they assume the features of the dead along with their feelings, wishes, and spirits. Find it. As for Yuko, they say whenever someone gets too close, the shell will stare in their direction. Slug Girl, Episode 3, Part 2. A classic Junji Ito body horror, the creature featured in this story will definitely give you the creeps. The story centers around a young girl called Yuko who slowly becomes reclusive and stops coming to school. Her friend Ri goes to check on her, only to see that her house has become infested with slugs, something that Yuko has been afraid of since she was a child. Ri found her sitting in her bedroom, wearing a face mask and refusing to let anyone look inside her mouth. The next day, Ri arrived to discover Yuko's mother in a state of fear, and Yuko's tongue had changed into a slug. Ri fled the house and never returned. <laughs> She mentions, however, hearing about Yuko and her parents' efforts to get rid of it. They attempted to remove her tongue, but it grew back. Filling her mouth with salt to get rid of it simply resulted in her spitting it out. Yuko grew severely ill as a result of her inability to eat, and her parents decided to bury her in a salt bathtub. She did not reappear from the salt tub as was expected, and her parents reached in to grab her, but they could only retrieve her clothes from the tub. Yuko appeared to have vanished. They discovered her head in the tub with her body shriveled to a teeny tiny size due to the salt. However, the slug that was present was seen creeping away from Yugo's mouth, still alive. Her head attached almost like a snail's shell. This visual will creep you out and you will never look at snails or slugs the same way again. Mommy! No! Mommy! No! The Dreamer. The Long Dream. Episode 2, Part 2. Long Dream is one of Ito's most well-known short stories, and it was adapted into a live-action television film in 2000, as well as an animated rendition in the second episode of the 2018 anime, Junji Ito Collection. In the story, a girl named Mami is in the hospital awaiting brain surgery. She claims that she has been visited by the embodiment of death and that she will die shortly. She begs Dr. Kuroda to save her, but Kuroda believes that she is hallucinating. 
Tetsuro Mukoda, another one of his patients, paid her a visit. Mukoda suffers from horrifying nightmares that, despite lasting only one night, last a year or more in his dreams. The physicians have no idea what to do with him, yet his dreams grow one year longer each night. Over time, incidents that occurred yesterday seem like they have occurred 50 years ago or more. He begins to speak as if he were from a different century. He also ages to the appearance of a very elderly man, making him the creepy dreamer. What am I doing in this place? Mukoda then records his longest dream yet. His body shatters into a pile of crystals when dawn breaks, having become too old to keep up with his dreams. Kuroda investigates the crystals but finds no connection to Mukoda's condition. Mami starts having long dreams like Mukoda, and when questioned, Kuroda admits that he gave her portions of Mukoda's remains. He reasoned that because she fears death and consequently emptiness, entering a condition of endless dreaming would allow her spirit to live forever. In the end, he becomes obsessed with his study and believes that one day all of humanity will want to enter the never-ending dream. <laughs> Disease, Shivers, Episode 4, Part 1 In the story Shivers, a young kid named Yuji and his friend Hideo look through a diary written by Yuji's grandfather. After purchasing a jade insect statue discovered in Java by an old comrade, he had a chill and was visited by a strange doctor who administered an injection. Holes began to appear in his skin, and droughts entered through them. Then, in swarms, insects crawled out of the opening. He dubbed it the Curse of the Jade Statue, and flung it into a nearby garden. He also suspected the doctor who had come to see him of attempting to take his jade. This same disease seems to plague Yuji's neighbor, a young girl called Rina. However, it turned out that after reading the story, Hideo had gone to look for a jade statue which resulted in him also contracting the illness. He goes wherever the jade goes! <laughs> Uh, no! Oh my god, it's him! Hideo, now entirely hollowed out with holes, breaks into Yuji's chamber that night. He went looking for the jade statue in the bushes outside Rina's house on the day they discovered the diary. He gambled on the curse since he knew that the jade had to be expensive. However, the holes in his flesh began to appear. He realized that he was now possessed by the statue and is unable to hurl it away, despite numerous attempts. He claims that the Doctor is the Curse's messenger, appearing anywhere the Jade goes. The Doctor emerges out of nowhere, and Hideo flees screaming. It was, in fact, the same Doctor that had treated his grandfather and Rina next door, making the story of the Jade statue very real. You never know when a treasure is actually a curse. His great-grandparents also started looking more transparent, almost foggy. Strange Tradition, Gentle Goodbye Episode 6, Part 2 Imagine a world where after a dear one dies, you could simply recreate their image in a lifelike manner that would sustain itself for a couple of decades before disappearing, so as to give the rest of the family members some more time to deal with the suddenness of death. Well, this concept is exactly what Ito explores in his story, Gentle Goodbye. The story revolves around a girl called Riko, who keeps dreaming about the passing of her father. She gets married to a man called Makoto. When Makoto's grandfather passes away and the mourners leave, Makoto's father leads the family in a ceremony to focus on the possibility of the deceased reappearing. Everyone does so, and Grandpa reappears soon after, despite the fact that he was burned. Makoto subsequently tells Riko that his family has always done this, and that these dead individuals are after images, illusions produced from the living's memories. They only stay for around 20 years before disappearing forever. But this is generally enough time to ease the family's sadness. Come to us! The story ends with a shocking twist, where it turns out that Riko herself was an afterimage. These illusions were actually very much sentient and not aware of the fact that they had died, continuing to live life as usual. Turns out that the day before their wedding, she was murdered in a car accident. With the exception of his dad, Makoto's relatives took pity on his dead fiancée, Riko, and consented to build an afterimage of her. Thus, they continued this strange tradition as it required a lot of people to manifest this afterimage that was living and breathing with no realization of their passing. Beware, if you do so, you will develop an endless thirst for the blood of others. 
Blood Drinking Monster, Blood Bubble Bushes, Episode 9, Part 2. This take on the traditional vampire appears in the short story, Blood Bubble Bushes, by Junji Ito. It features two youngsters, Ansai and Kana, and a vampire who is desperate for blood. The story begins with Ansai and Kana crashing their car into someone, causing blood to splatter everywhere. While looking for help, they are attacked by many young boys who have razor-sharp teeth. It is while fleeing from them that they encounter the terrible vampire who at first seems like a helpful and kind man. He takes them in and tells them a story of how his girlfriend killed herself and from her throat grew a tree whose fruits drained her blood. However, turns out that it was all a lie. It was hard for me to believe because the blood that grew from my love's neck was still a part of her. Ansai awakens in the middle of the night to find the man consuming Kana's blood. Ansai notices the blood trail that brought him to the house and recalls that he never found out where it led. He follows it to a door in the home, which leads to a yard full of trees bearing blood-filled fruits. The man had converted all of the villagers into trees, and his story about his lover was a lie. As a vampire, he needed the fruit to keep his blood supply going. However, now that all the people had turned into mummies, he was hunting for a new sacrifice. The veins suck the vitality out of the person once the tree begins to develop. The only way to avoid this fate is to consume their own blood bubble, but doing so transforms the person into a vampire. Quite terrifying, isn't it? Hanging Balloons the Face Burglar, Volume 4 of the Horror World of Junji Ito Collection, contains the sixth chapter, The Hanging Balloons. Every living individual in the story has a dangling balloon that reflects their own face. These balloons are linked to lengthy ropes that are used to track down and murder the person they resemble. If a human kills one of the flying balloons, they die horrifyingly and hideously. Ito took inspiration for the hanging balloons from a childhood dream, according to Grappe.jp. The dangerous creatures from the title story are made up of severed heads that float around like balloons and terrorize their real-life counterparts. In the story, Terumi Fujino commits suicide by hanging herself with a noose from a telephone wire. It was after this incident that huge flying balloon heads began appearing all over Tokyo. However, they were not harmless and instead were constantly trying to trick people into hanging themselves or killing them. Terumi's best friend, Kazuko, finds herself in a fix as people all around her begin getting killed and taken away by these hanging balloon heads. Soon, everyone was caught by the balloons, and their bodies hung in the sky, including Kazuko's mother, who had gone to look for Yusuke. Kazuko is imprisoned inside the house by herself. But at the end of the story, it is implied that she was also killed by the hanging balloon that had her face. This one is quite horrifying and the imagery will give you chills. Often, nothing is scarier than an innocent thing like a balloon being mutated into a floating killing machine. The Licking Woman In the short story of the same name, the Licking Woman is the main antagonist. The story begins with a man named Tisuyoshi walking to his fiancée Miku's house when he is attacked by a mysterious woman who licks his face and hand. He becomes unwell, collapses, and dies, as does Miku's dog, which licked the woman's spit off Tisuyushi's skin. Tests reveal that they have a biotoxin in their blood. Soon after, another guy is assassinated by the woman, who has a massive, extended, infected tongue. People are being cautioned to remain watchful, and she is soon caught and sent to jail. Many years later, Miku is in a pub where he meets Nagaoka. When they start conversing, they realize that they were both victims of the Licking Woman. Miku swears to kill the woman when she learns that she was released. Nagaoka advises that Miku coat her skin in lethal potassium cyanide, which she can procure from the laboratory where she works, and then have the woman lick it, poisoning herself. Miku pursues her, and the woman collapses and dies after licking the cyanide, but not before reaching inside her mouth and literally ripping off her own tongue. It dives into Miku's throat and nearly chokes her before falling to the ground. Miku, on the other hand, begins to suspect that Nagaoka is the licking woman, and that she has used Miku for a malevolent purpose. Miku eventually starts seeing a new boyfriend and puts her past behind her. When they kiss, however, they are attacked by the woman's massive tongue and found dead, poisoned by potassium cyanide. Eyewitness tales of a massive tongue bouncing around at the scene are ignored by police. Be careful when you kiss your Tinder date, eh? The Human Chair 
The Human Chair is a horrifying story about how a carpenter used to build armchairs with space for himself to fit inside of the chair itself. The story follows this man and his life in the chair as he falls in love with the woman who sits on it regularly. The woman is a renowned writer and a diplomat's wife. The fear that Ido plays on in this story is the apprehension of someone breaching a personal space. Everyone in their home has a favorite chair. Sure, we don't mind if someone else sits on it, but we'd prefer to be the one sitting on it. It's our own chair. This is where we feel the most at ease. At the same time, it is also where we are most vulnerable. This carpenter was apparently living in the chair. There was food and water available for him, as well as a chamber pot for when he needed to relieve himself. He likely only left the chair at night to change the pot. When the spouse beats the chair, he displays a frighteningly stoic reaction to pain. This man, whoever he is, was so enamored with the woman that he couldn't leave her side while she was writing. He had fallen in love with her while living inside her chair and truly believed that if she didn't sit on the chair, she wouldn't be able to write her novels. Another revelation that happens in the course of the story is that the woman went insane and decided to live in the chair with the chairman after it was found out that was indeed someone living in the chair as the person had murdered her husband from within the chair itself. A descendant of theirs continues to be in the chair business and offers women, especially writers, the same treatment of giving them a chair comfortable enough with a man inside it for optimal flow of thoughts. Would you ever try this out if you had writer's block? Count me out, but how about you? Eel. Given that galophobia, which is the fear of sharks, is one of the most common fears throughout human history, Ido's creation of the walking shark in Gyo is the stuff of nightmares. The murderous great white shark can walk on four legs and follow its human victims on land and in water. The merciless killing machine and unstoppable alpha predator walks on four artificial spider-like legs, fusing the scary iconography of an ancient sea creature with that of an unusual arachnoid which terrifies readers to no end. Junji Ito drew Gyo. The inspiration, in his words, came from Steven Spielberg's Jaws, in which Spielberg expertly portrayed the essence of horror in the shape of a man-eating shark. Ito reasoned that it would be even more exciting to capture that terror in a man-eating shark that can fare on land as well as sea. Tadashi and Kaori are a couple fighting to survive against a mysterious horde of undead fish with metal legs propelled by an odor known as the Death Stench. Gyo begins with a fishing crew bringing up a bunch of strange looking fish in the boat's net. When they examine the strange creatures, they see that the bizarre fish appear to have legs. The fish then scurry away, diving back into the ocean. These fish are discovered by Kaori and Tadashi, and soon, many of these legged marine creatures, including the titular walking shark, start coming onto the land. The fish was created as a result of the Japanese Army's World War II research into a virus that causes its host to emit a lethal and disgusting smell, in a desperate attempt to shift the course of the war. The virus was then pumped into a host, causing the host to release the gas that powers the machine's movement via pneumatics. Walking machines were designed to transport the host further, allowing them to reach and sicken enemy forces. However, enemy planes sunk the ship carrying the prototypes of the walking machines, causing them to wreak havoc on the marine population and finally invade cities like Tokyo. Gray! Mm, disgusting! <laughs> Glyceride. This story will make you quite nauseous, so I recommend that you steal your nerves for this one. The villain is none other than oil and grease, which turns humans into monsters. The plot revolves around a young girl called Yui, and her family who run a barbecue restaurant and also live above it. Their entire building is covered with oil and grease, and this starts affecting Yui and her brother. Her brother starts developing acne and a bad temper. He guzzles oil like it was water. One day, he throws a fit of rage, essentially going mad, as he pops his acne and rains down pus on Yui. Their father is forced to stop him and ends up killing him. To hide his crime, he chops up his son and serves the human meat in the restaurant, which becomes a massive hit amongst the people who have no idea that they are eating human flesh. <laughs> However, the meat runs out, and Yui's father turns his eyes on her, as she develops acne and a temper just like her elder brother. He tries forcing her to drink oil, but she locks herself in her room. She later finds her father drinking the oil instead, and he cuts off his own leg to serve to the customers because they only wanted that kind of meat. 
At the end of the story, Yui's body reaches a 100% oil saturation, showing how the oil and grease had practically mutated them because as she watched her father sever his own leg, she noticed that there was no blood flowing from the wound. Instead, all there was, was oil. You might not want to reach for that greasy piece of pizza for the next couple of days. Army of One, Sewn Corpses Army of One, one of Junji Ito's most renowned one-shot stories, is universally lauded by readers and is sometimes referred to as Ito's magnum opus, even going so far as to declare the short manga better than its parent manga, Hellstar Romina. In this one, mysterious bodies of people who have died or disappeared start showing up, sewn together. Not only that, people also start disappearing in large numbers and later showing up with their corpses sewn in the same manner. What is really scary about Army of One is that no one knows who runs the organization or where it is based. Even when it gets labeled as a terrorist organization, the police and army seem unable to track them down. They recruit people by airdropping pamphlets that ask people to join them in their cause. The only explanation that we could find is that these pamphlets and the mass hysteria caused by the killings only propelled more and more people to go crazy, as they became mandated to stay indoors and avoid social gatherings in fear of getting killed and sewn up. These people further carried on the murders, making it so extreme that it required the attention of the Japanese army. And to think, we lived through the age of social isolation. With this, we come to the end of our list. Do you like horror manga? What are some of your favorites? And if you liked our content, don't forget to leave a like and subscribe to us if you haven't already. Have a good one and be safe. Thanks everyone.